Exactly. Yeah. So when we talk about the opposition, uh, sort of breaking down the open door, if you will, and saying we are going back to Russia, they're not really surprising. This is nothing. Georgians do not need to be told how not to go back into the Russian fold. All this is all that is happening basically is an artificially manufactured sort of exasperation, sensationalism, and radicalization. Given, you know, given this sort of geopolitical, geoeconomic scenario that is unfolding before our eyes, um, again, I think this collective West is losing its ground. It, a, it has not provided anything substantial. B, it's only causing trouble and increasing Georgia's sort of existential threat because of these narratives. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I've got again Georgi Lasha Kasratze with me. Lasha is an international relations analyst working in the U.S. as a liaison officer for Georgia's Sokhumi State University. He's currently back home in Georgia, and since during the last two months, again, a lot of things have happened in this small Caucasian nation, especially after the passage of the new NGO law. I thought it's time for an update again. So, Lasha, welcome back to the show. Great to be back, Pascal. Thank you. Lasha, you're right now in Georgia and you've been doing research, especially about, you know, how the uh, the mood is in Georgia, what the political situation looks like. Uh, can you give us a rundown? What is Georgia like at the moment on a political level? Uh, yes, absolutely. So I'm in Tbilisi uh, and it's lovely here, um, uh, you know, I, with all the political and economic problems that the country faces, uh, there is still some cultural charm that Georgia has always had that attracts outsiders. Um, and uh, uh, if I uh, uh, may say so myself, I'm enjoying staying here. But at the same time, I am also uh, closely observing uh, the reality on the ground. Um, and Pascal, the... the um, impression that I've gotten so far, I've been here for almost a month, uh, is that um, there is a social sort of stability, political stability uh, that uh, the society is enjoying. Um, and I think this is attributable to the current government's policies. Uh, I was very surprised when I was here before COVID, um, uh, uh, six years ago or so, seven years ago or so, um, I didn't get the same sense. Um, it was more chaotic uh, and um, um, more politically sort of uh, city was in a turmoil. That's the, that's the sense that I got. Um, but this time around, um, there is stability in, in the city. Um, there is certain amount of tourism that is taking place. Um, people seem to be busy with their daily lives. Uh, um, and um, and they're sort of minding their own business. That's the that's the sense I get. Sure, there is frustration with 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 politics, with economics, with certain unemployment. Uh, but overall, there is this sense, this collective sense that um, um, you know Georgians would rather have this current situation uh, than uh, what the alternative could have been. For example, considering. Um, uh, sort of this Western onslaught on against the current government's policies um, uh, in regards to the quote unquote Russian law um, uh, that they pushed through the government, pushed through the parliament and adapted, uh, which was the law um, on NGOs. Uh, uh, and so, um, you know, things when that whole process was taking place, comparatively speaking, uh, and, and what's happening today, uh, it's a night and day difference. Um, and to my surprise, um, you know, that political uh, fervor sort of subsided uh, and society sort of moved on. That's the sense you get. Um, and then, of course, through my conversations uh, with, with experts, local experts here, um, I basically get the same sense, unless you are a radical sort of opposition 
um, member or just an, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, dissatisfied citizen, to, so to speak. And I completely understand there are plenty of them. Uh, and there is reasons to be dissatisfied. Unemployment is still high. And, you know, there, you know, Georgia has its own sort of standard, same problems, economics, politics, so far, uh, so forth. But, um, you know, both experts, journalists, um, analysts, um, uh, they have this uh, sort of um, success successful failure sense uh, view of what's happening in, in, in the country. And everyone is anticipating that, you know, with these current elections that are uh, uh, in October, um, uh, I think it is going to be on October 24th that are coming up, uh, parliamentary elections. Um, I, I have not seen a person who would say, we need to either change the government or overthrow this government or these guys have to go or... People say there has to be some political balance. Uh, you know, the coalition government has to oppose it um, so that we won't have, uh, a, a, you know, a, a single party um, sort of, a, a, you know, autocratic regime forming. Uh, but I've never, I have not heard people say, you know, this government has to completely go or that we need to overthrow this government or this is just unacceptable. Um, there is always... There is the sense that they're keeping with the middle ground, um, you know, mixture of stability with slight change in the parliament where, say, for example, a coalition type government will balance against um, the current government, which is fine, which is quite democratic. Um, and if there will be a legislative sort of opposition through democratic process, I'm all for that. Uh, but again, I have not seen folks who watch this stuff and analyze this say this government has to go and we have to accept we have to adopt some sort of a radical policy uh, uh of change right so um last time we spoke was right when this ngo law was passed and what we saw back then in the western media were people on the street waving uh, European flags and, and protesting and saying, oh, no, this is a draconian uh, a government that is trying to cuddle up, cozy up to Russia, and they're going to go the Russian way. And then we've had your president, that French-born uh, lady, who who tried to weigh in on her head. Yes. And... And 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 portray that she's a, a, a pro-Europeanist and that you know Georgia Georgia's parliament is being draconian, like stupid stuff like that. But we've seen these pictures. But are, do you think that the people who can be mobilized to go to the street and demonstrate that they represent overall a small faction of Georgia's um, population? And if so, then what, who are the, who are the people who were protesting and who would probably not agree with your portrayal? Yes, they certainly won't agree with my portrayal. Um, these are the folks who are, first of all, I, I, I fully support young people coming out in the streets and, uh, and expressing their uh, dissatisfaction with any government. I I, I respect young generations, uh, and uh, um, when they you know uh, when they express dissatisfaction with the political system, I don't see anything wrong with that, especially in a democratic society. Uh, here in Georgia, though, uh, that has not been the case. Uh, I think um, one of the reasons why um, there was this limitation on the NGO sector uh, that was imposed. Um, uh, is precisely this, that there is an extreme sort of stigmatized, radical side to this protest. They're not exactly protesting, say, economic problems or political social issues. They're protest they were protesting, um, they were basically repeating the following phrase, the Russian law, we don't want to go back to Russia. And that was a good indication that this was coming from the outside. Um, and to contrast what they were saying and what I'm seeing, for example, uh, is to say that there is little small sense, not a significant sense, that Russia, Georgia is going back into Russia's fold. 
there is a strong sense that this is a pragmatic approach to the to relations with Moscow. But collective sense is still very much wary of, of Russia, of what Russia is capable of. In other words, the Georgian-ness, if you will, with the traditional Georgian view of what Russia is for Georgia in terms of its occupation, in terms of its ability to do so again, in terms of its, uh, you know, you know, k k capability to come in and reinvade Georgia once again, that collective sense has always been within the Georgian society. Yeah. So when we talk about the opposition, uh, sort of breaking down the open door, if you will, and saying, we are going back to Russia, they're not really surprising. This is nothing. Georgians do not need to be told how not to go back into the Russian fold. All this is all that is happening basically is an artificially manufactured sort of exasperation, sensationalism, and radicalization. I, I mean, everybody uses this word, and I hate using it, but I haven't, you know, I, I cannot come up with a better word. It is basically a radicalization of what is already obvious within the Georgian society, what has already been obvious for, for centuries, if you will. Uh, since Russia's occupation of, of Georgia. And so when we talk about this particular government waking up one day and choosing to go back to, you know, to go back under Russia's influence, um, that that is, that is just simply not true. It's a stupid they narrative, are, right? It's just a dumb narrative to it is, feed it is, it, Western populations because yes, like, still we, you don't have diplomatic relations even now with Russia, right? It's not only that, not only that, but this under this current government and these processes had started before they made these decisions and before they finalized this this um, uh, contracts with with the EU, which is the association agreement uh, and the uh, free visa travel. I mean, it happened under this government. Yes, the process, you know, had started under Saakashvili. Uh, and even before, I would argue, under Shevardnadze, but this government finalized. So there is no specific evidence to say that this government is taking the country um, under Russia's, in, in, into, you know, driving the country into Russia's arms. Uh, and now here is here is a sort of a, a uh, unbelievable thing that I heard a couple of days ago from the opposition members. Now they're saying that they've never said that Georgian business people and entrepreneurs or the Georgian economy should not interact with the Russian economy or that Georgians should not sell wine to Moscow or Georgians should not sell their mineral waters to Russia or, you know. So now they're saying they have never said that when uh, there was a um, there was a, um, uh, um, a, a TV program uh, that sort of uh, uh, put the all the denials, uh, the examples of all the all, all the um, um, criticisms of, of coming from the opposition uh, that were radically demanding uh, that the current government stop trading with with Russia, and now they're saying that they've never said something like that, anything anything of that sort, and they're they're presenting themselves to the public now, where they're saying, of course we're all, we're supporting the open trade with Russia. What's wrong with it? So you see this flip-flopping, you see this hypocrisy, but this is the, this is the stuff that Georgians have always lived with. Um, the problem is the, the problem is sort of deepening of this coming from the Western narratives. Uh, in other words, if Georgians are sort of left alone and given sort of strategic autonomy, if you will, uh, or strategic flexibility, I, I wrote a short op-ed um, uh, on this, I think I think things will calm down on its on their own. Things things will just calm down, Georgians. Just like I'm witnessing right now, people just will realize uh, and will go that that peace is better, stability is better, and they will just you know mind their own business, figure out a way how to make uh, to make a living. But when you have these radical narratives sort of enter the society. And that's when you start seeing um, uh, political divisions and uh, further stigmatization of, of, of the members of the society. And um, that's when you are seeing sort of, um, you know, coming closer uh, to sort of civil war, if you will. Yeah.
And, and that's very sad because it's artificially manufactured. Um, because if left alone, again, I cannot stress this enough, people will just live their lives. Of course, there will be uh, you know disagreement and different opinions on, on the current government, but that's fine. Uh, but you know they will just go along um, and 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 live in peace, if you will, um, yeah. mind their own business and figure out how to make a next dollar to support their families. But that's the problem because Georgia is now pretty much caught between a rock and a hard place because on the one hand, as you said, nobody needs to to teach Georgia how not to go into the Russian fold. The, even the Georgia Dream uh, Party, everybody understands that going that way is not an option. On the other hand, right. the Europeans and the Americans are very unhappy for Georgia not, not jumping high enough, right? It's like, right. you are not doing enough of what we're telling you to do. You need to do more because... These people have the idea, and we know that. I mean, people speak about this officially um, in certain think tanks in Washington, that you need to open a second front against Russia, right? A second yes. battering ramp. And yes. Georgia officially said, no, we don't want to do this. That's the difference with Ukraine. In Ukraine, the political process was changed back in 2014 from somebody who said, we're not going to do that. We're going to go, we're going to play our middle ground into somebody who was then willing to go that route and be the battering ram, right? So the danger Correct. right now is that something like this, A, might be manufactured again, or B, that then if that's not possible, that the NATO side will increase the pressure so much, starting with sanctions and so on, that these internal you know, uh, processes heat up and then create the, the instability that you need in order to maybe, after all, turn things around. Because what we've learned over the past couple of years is that the West doesn't like Russia, hates them quite a bit. And it also doesn't like the neutrals. It doesn't like the ones who don't play along. So th those are secondary targets. And it seems to me that Russia, that, uh, that Georgia right now has this secondary target bullseye on it. Um, how do you think, or from your discussions, how do you, how, how do you feel that people try to deal with this problem? No, I want I want to second everything you just said. What I'm, I want to give it also a uh, sort of a geopolitical flair to it uh, in a second here. Uh, but um, uh, Georgia is a soft sort of a positive uh, copy and paste of what's happening between the West and Russia. Right? It's just a small space where that disagreement uh, plays out in this tiny nation. Inside, you mean that, in the local political process? In, in a local political process in Georgia. Um, and we saw the ugly side of that play out in Ukraine. And we saw the first signs of that playing out in 2008 in Georgia, which was the first country, by the way, that sort of was the was on the uh, um, uh, bitter end of the, of that of that political stick, if you will. Um, and in five days, of course, everyone forgot about it. And uh, uh, one of the things that I'm happy about is that the fact that this current government avoided such a tragedy again, which would have been forgotten within six months, right? So, but by, by, by that time, Georgians might not have had their republic anymore. Uh, so just the fact that they've tried to avoid such a tragedy from recurring, they deserve credit for that. Now, with the current sort of geopolitical side of these things, of, of, of this thing, um, I am continuing to cling to my principal argument here. Um, Russia has warned, Putin has warned that any attempt uh, to repeat a Rose Revolution in Georgia uh, will, you know, will be met with Russian response. Harsh Russian response. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but the, the gist and the idea is that Russia will not sit back and allow it to happen all over again. Number one. Number two, how how Russia will handle it, we can talk about it. It's either going to be military or, you know, most likely it's probably going to be a military incursion, invasion once again. Um, so let's just let's just hope that it won't happen. Um, then the second the, the second aspect of this is um, the United States, the collective West, really they do not have many options here. Uh, this is not the United States that we saw in 2003 or before that or after, shortly after uh, you know this collapse of the Soviet Union uh, this is no longer this sort of this unipole America um, 
And this is a very important aspect, in my opinion. What are they, on a fundamental level, if we ask this ugly question, what are they going to do if Georgia uh, becomes recalcitrant and says, you know what, we don't care, we don't want war? Uh, now you have Russia up north, right? That is much stronger and more powerful than it was before 2008. So we can only imagine how, you know, yes, it's occupied with Ukraine. And yes, analysts are saying that it's acquiescing to a lot of regional changes, but uh, that that is that is not enough for Russia not to do, you know, not to prevent another color revolution in Georgia. Let's remember when Russia was down on its knees, uh, it still managed to conduct a brutal war with Chechnya in the nineties, right? And it still managed to basically. Um, uh, you know, uh, conduct, you know, invade Georgia in 2008 and basically tell the West, look, what are you good? This is my backyard. This is my geopolitical space. And any talk of NATO coming into some remote Caucasus, Southern South, South Caucasus is unacceptable. That's a red line. The same as with, um, with Ukraine. So in today's terms, what is Washington going to do now? Yes. Um, a, a political turmoil can be manufactured. And yes, Georgia will be divided and it will be probably a civil war. And physically, Georgia might be turned into a rump state, right? The worst case scenario, right? In terms of Russia's military invasion and so forth. But do we honestly think that America is going to accomplish something if the collective West decides to embark on that path? Because at the end of the day, they failed to provide security guarantees to Georgia. There is no NATO for Georgia. I keep saying this. There will, there, there's no, there have never been a realistic prospect of NATO membership for Georgia, which means there will never be, it has never been a security guarantee from the United States for Georgia, to Georgia. That means Georgia because it remains to be a vulnerable state, a tiny, small nation that can be invaded from any which way. Um, and that leaves Georgia with itself, meaning they have to come up with a plan to avoid an invasion from Russia and to, to, uh, uh, to avoid a political invasion from the West, yeah. meaning political manufactured turmoil, ideological import or export from the West. Um, and these there are these parasitic narratives that have come, that have kept sort of uh, you know uh, you know kept the Georgian society on the edge of the precipice. So you have soft power invasion, if you will, propagandistic sort of invasion versus hard power Russian invasion that Georgia is trying to sort of stave off. Yeah. Um, and you know what? Ironically speaking. Uh, a much simpler and more obvious answer lies between Tbilisi and Moscow. Do not antagonize Moscow. It's simple as that. And do not buy into the soft power, uh, you know, soft power sort of uh, uh, provocations from 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 the collective West. And things will be okay. It's it's, it's quite interesting because that's the it's Finnish just lesson. The that's the lesson Finland forgot. That's the lesson Finland. Correct. That's the strategy <clears throat> Finland used in the Cold War and now completely threw overboard. But you're absolutely right. And what we also see is that, uh, you know, for NATO and for the collective West, it's better to have a proxy that is not part of the alliance because you can use that. I mean, the NATO members themselves are useless in terms of actually, you know, uh, yeah. trying to fight a hot war because yes. that's what you want to avoid, right? So you need the outside little one. And Ukraine is like really, I mean, I, I feel extremely sorry for them, the, the worst of both worlds. But so in terms then of, of stiving off both sides, which is, you know, neutrality is not the art of making friends with everybody. It's the art of giving everybody a middle finger and have them live with it. So it's Correct. how would you do that with, the, the current situation, which though is like quite, it's quite important that the big difference to Ukraine is A, no war, no, no hot fighting. B, the Russians didn't actually incorporate the Abkhazia and South Ossetia in their state territory, right? They, they did that with Ukraine because 
they had to, and but they didn't do it with Georgia. So there is still space to to negotiate something. And is there anything moving in that direction? Russia's reciprocity uh, in regards to that issue was not to um, accept the referendum uh, from Abkhazia uh, in terms of you know as as a, as a, as a reci reciprocity to Tbilisi uh, to sort of recognize and appreciate. Uh, um, you know Georgia's um, refusal to engage in sanctions against Russia, or open, or or, or even much less, um, you know, open up the second front against Russia. Uh, but in 2008, Russia did recognize um, uh, Tsinvali and, and Abkhazia as independent states, um, which, by the way, they probably did not even want to do uh, themselves uh, within with, with with Russia. And and here is here is the thing I can I can already hear. Uh, sort of the rad, you know, some of the radical political uh, forces in Georgia calling me all kinds of names, but uh, but um, uh, be that as it may, um, you know, the idea that Russia wants to occupy Georgia, continue to con conquer or to conquer Georgia, and then place its forces in Tbilisi or in surrounding areas in Georgia. Uh, I don't think that's the case. I don't think Russia is in mood for that right now. Will it go that far? Yes. If the situation turned dramatically against Russia, of course it would do it. Uh, there is no doubt about it. But in terms of occupation, long-term occupation of Georgia, that's not that's the last thing Russia wants now. Uh, and you can see sort of as a result of this pragmatic politics, Russia is sort of slowing down, sort of showing its soft side where it can, where it's signaling that a conversation can take place between Tbilisi and Moscow. It's still a long ways to go, but there are some steps uh, that, that Russia you know, has taken so far. For example, the refusal to recognize uh, this, uh, uh, this referendum on, on that the, uh, um, uh, the de facto regime in, in, in um, uh, in um, uh, so whom he demanded, and they refused it. They said no because they appreciate what Russia, what Georgia has done towards 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 Moscow in terms of implementing this pragmatic politics. Um, so there can be a dialogue. Um, there can be a common platform that can be constructed for uh, that will be based on you know national security interests of both states. Uh, which, by the way, this key phrase, this national security, has been relegated to the margins, right? If you listen to it, because when we listen to the collective West, they're not talking about these things. They cannot define for Georgia what national security interests are. To them, national security interest is this extremely sort of normative, idealistic foreign policy. Uh, uh, you know, everyone is an oligarch and uh, every, you know, everybody, everyone is corrupt and, you know, human rights and NGO rights. But, this, you know, behind it, there is no substance. Where is the national security guarantee that you are pro have promised Georgia for the past 30 years? Nowhere to be found because you cannot provide it. Because on a fundamental level, they understand that they cannot enter and turn South Caucasus, um, no matter how much they try, historically even, uh, into a uh, uh, into a uh, sort of a spring, you know, a, a springboard uh, against Russia, uh, where they can turn Georgia into some paramilitary state where there will be perpetual war against Russia, uh, some sort of a South Caucasian jungle where there will always be a perpetual resistance against Moscow. It's just not going to happen uh, because, ironically, Russia will prevent that from happening against, you know, uh, to protect its own interests. So um, at the end of the day, the question is, what are they going to do? Right. We see now in Ju beginning of July 3rd and 4th, I think there was a huge Shanghai cooperation meeting in Kazakhstan. I mean, you see how this whole Eurasian sphere, Eurasian space is changing, is coming together, if you will. Um, uh, and by the way, that whole South Caucasus geopolitical space, uh, that there, there has been a lot of talk about that from different perspectives. Where is the South Caucasian geopolitical space heading? Uh, where is it heading? And the answer is basically to stay away from all the troubles and to to engage in this introspective geopolitics where Russia, you know, the United States, the European Union, China, you know, uh, 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 Turkey, regional powers will come in and 
do business within the South Caucasian space, utilize its geopolitical location to basically make money, to to uh, further you know hone uh, geoeconomic projects and to basically engage in geoeconomic mutual benefit um, that these oil pipelines that have been put together since the early 90s uh, offer uh, the potential for. Um, and so this is the shape that is the contours of which that you can see today uh, in the region. And so this whole you know, Western narrative is getting old, to be perfectly honest with you. Those the people who are actually looking at it from a, you know closely um, realize that there is there has never been anything substantial behind it. That has just been narratives. Uh, and while look, I grew up in the states, and I understand this. This is the stuff of great power politics, right? This is you know, Soviet Union had this type of propaganda. Russia currently has this type of propaganda. You know. But the most powerful one is this unipolar moment when the United States used this propaganda to basically go out there and and you know act as a 500 pound gorilla um, you know in a, in, a, in a China shop basically um, and justifying it uh, through um, uh, through um, uh, you know this this neoliberal you know idealistic narratives. Um, with, with very little substance behind it. Um, and I think it's coming, a lot of people are coming to realization that this just has been an empty talk, basically. Because if you look at it, yes, they've spent $6 billion in Georgia for the past three years. But what has Georgia gotten out of it? Yes, the recognition of the uh, of separatist, uh, non-recognition of separatist region by the European Union and the United States, for which the Georgian people People will always be grateful. Political legitimacy of Georgia, yes, great. But in terms of Georgia's industrialization policy, development, and most importantly, uh, most importantly, provision of security guarantees, Georgia hasn't seen any uh, any success in either of those categories. Uh, and now, on top of everything, on, on top of all that, now Georgia. Now there is this increasing sense that it is it is being used as a weapon now against Russia, against this collective Western hatred uh, to implement this collective Western hatred for Russia. Fine, you guys say at each other, fight it out. But you know, South Caucasus and this tiny impoverished state to be used as a weapon especially when you know that that will increase an existential threat to Georgia. How are you going to justify any of that? Um, and the way they want to justify it is, which is in their, in, in their mind, the best case scenario would be if a conflict broke out, okay, and Georgia were to be turned into a rump state, just like Ukraine, and then there would be sort of a continuous, continuous perpetual warfare against Moscow, you know, West will give us a couple of rockets here and there, right? And they will tell us, look, fight against the evil Russia, right? But this evil Russia will come into Georgia if that were to occur and take Belize within a couple of days. It's not, it's, this is not Ukraine. You know, I hate to say it. I, I, I have enormous respect for Georgian military trained by the United States. Um, and I respect them enormously. And these are our heroes. But let's be honest here. You know, Moscow will ha not have a hard time taking Georgia, yeah, and if plus, that happens, then it, be, it will be the end of the Georgian Republic. Plus, and, NATO already spent all of its capacities on Ukraine. <laughs> There's not much that they could give anymore to Georgia at the moment. Course, so you wouldn't even, I mean, that even that one is uh, is off the table. That's I an excellent point. Yes, missiles. they're struggling to provide Ukraine with weaponry now. So, absolutely. Uh, so Georgia is in an impossible situation unless it's, it sort of looks introspectively into and, and looks for answers within itself. And hopefully both the society and the political system, uh, the government, uh, will, will sort of realize that there will be a sort of a, a shared um, sense of danger of what, what it is that they're actually um, are up, up against. Yeah, the, the, the problem is that historically, 
speaking neutral countries, and I just frame now Georgia as neutral, although Georgia never declared neutrality, but let's just frame it as such analytically for, the, for a moment. The neutral countries are then are, are successful in maintaining or getting, getting that status or remaining neutral when the overall, the, the, the weather is more or less good. Switzerland in 1815, that's when the weather cleared up and became more cooperative. Austria in 1955, it was a moment when the great powers actually decided let's not nuke each other, uh, more or less officially. It's like, okay, the first wave of, the, of, of a little bit of detente. Um, whereas they are most unsuccessful when, when, the, when, these, when these big powers still want to fight it out, Laos and Cambodia. In the, right. in the Cold War, uh, Ukraine right now in, 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 20, in 2022, the decision was, OK, let's do it on the battlefield. And Ukraine became the battlefield and the Americans were also able to turn it into that. Right. So the question for, mm -hmm. for uh, Georgia in that case is how do you maintain enough political unity to go that route and uh, deter <laughs> both uh, ideologically, the West and 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 militarily and Russia. Although I don't think Russia needs deterrence, I think what 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 would what would be needed with Russia is a is a common framework for for uh, security thinking in the Caucasus. Correct. What well, first of all, the, with the with the um, uh, neutrality um, concept for Georgia. Um, well, didn't Sw Switzerland had military? armed neutrality correct switzerland yes. had armed yes, neutrality yes, yes, yes. and then georgia cannot afford to do that georgia first of all it has to be recognized uh and plus uh georgia doesn't have cannot uh, uh put together a a coalition of alliances to check russia who is it going to do who is this who is georgia going to do it with azerbaijan and armenia or turkey or what iran or it's ridiculous it's laughable georgia doesn't have a sort of a, a realist um uh in in terms of sort of real politic capacity to build coalition uh sort of uh, um 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 alliance coalition against russia so plus it's going to have a very hard time achieving um neutrality uh so you neither so on the one hand you have uh, if you really want to sort of make this a, a, a you know a realist sort of political realist uh, case you have no capacity to build alliances to check Russia and you you're going to have a very hard time achieving official sort of perpetual um, permanent um, neutrality because it has to be recognized. Uh, well, and whether could, or not you could you could just declare it you could just say like we declare mm -hmm. our neutrality and then see what happens if recognition Correct. comes it's, along that's an option absolutely but the the third alternative to that right now is in georgia is is this whole single creating sort of this single geopolitical space out of the south caucasus Right. And yes, people are asking, look, Armenia is doing its own thing and Azerbaijan is doing its own thing. So how can you guys create a single space? Well, if you look at if you listen to what Aliyev has been saying, what Erdogan has been saying, um, that that notion is quite possible. Uh, that, that concept where the basically saying that no outside power, Western or otherwise, has the right to come in and pluck out any one Southern Caucasian nation and use it to implement its own, you know, interests at the expense of that nation. Um, and so given geopolitical, geoeconomic projects, given the fact that China now has come in, and by the way, acquired 49% of the Georgia strategic port that United States has missed the opportunity to acquire, that's exactly what happened. Because first of all, let me just go back to that for a second. This port Anaglia was a very controversial. Uh, it was a very controversial uh, uh, issue when 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 um, there were when it was being discussed. Um, first, the Georgian government announced um, uh, the plan to bring in uh, investors uh, to acquire the Anaglia port and for for development. Uh, and then I, I don't remember. I don't know if you recall, but um, uh, Pompeo uh, Trumps. Uh, 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 yeah. Secretary of State came to Georgia. Yeah, 
foreign secretary came to Georgia um, requesting that Georgia not allow any other power to come in to build, to acquire the port. I've spoken to folks here who have actually been directly involved in raising money and capital for that project. And they've said that there was no strategic interest for the United States to actually acquire that port. It was just a political uh, resistance, political narrative, once again, saying that the United States would not like to see any other power coming in and acquiring a strategic port on the Black Sea, uh, Black Sea coast of Georgia. Um, well, guess what? As this back and forth was taking place, the Georgian government once again used this sort of sense of pragmatism and brought in China. And now China acquired the 49% of this port. That increases, in my opinion, um, or decreases chances for the United States to stir trouble because China will have its own interests. It's very uh, smart, in, in and the, it also decreases the chances of Russia steering trouble because Russia wants correct. to Correct. So they're all the going to be checking and balancing against each other. Uh, so you get stability, plus you have money coming in from China as a, into Georgia, uh, into, into the uh, state budget of Georgia as a transition country. Um, so given, you know, given this sort of geopolitical, geoeconomic scenario that is unfolding before our eyes, um, again, I think this collective West is losing its ground. It, a, it has not provided anything substantial. B, it's only causing trouble and increasing Georgia's sort of existential threat because of these narratives. You know, even though it is the West that has been protecting us uh, and, and giving us opportunities to join the European Union, that is true. But they're sort of stabbing themselves in the foot. They, they, they're shooting themselves in the foot on their, all on, on their own. It, because if you ask Georgians, they just cannot understand what this ham-handed approach to, to the region is actually giving Washington or Brussels. Uh, so this has been just a foolish policy with a foolish outcome. The only danger I see here is these narratives still have enough political power um, to you know, to erupt into social discontent and, you know, social divisions and political divisions and create some sort of a chaos, once again, political chaos in Georgia. That's the only, and then in that case, depending on how that situation would escalate, Russia would take concrete steps. In other words, Russia at the end of the day will act, okay? And so, although or, um, react, right? That's the thing. Or if react. if Georgia goes down a certain path, the Russians will not take chances. They will intervene. I don't. You, correct. The Russians will not take any chances, especially now. And so, what is Washington thinking? It's very tough to pinpoint. Uh, uh, the continuation of political chaos in Georgia. Um, uh, you know, it, it doesn't. Again, my sense is. Even those who disagree with this government, and I'm talking about members of the society, do not want to see uh, yet another political upheaval, yet another political revolution. Those days, that political energy, in my opinion, is gone. Now, I might be completely ready. If I am wrong on this, you're going to be recording this, right? We are recording this. So send this video to me every year on Christmas <laughs> as a reminder. But I just do not see how, you know, the whole Rose Revolution mood uh, can be switched back on um, where Russia is so vigilant, uh, uh, you know, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of Ukraine and then looking at its own periphery, uh, South Caucasus and what the what the United States and Brussels are doing. I just watch Russia just won't allow that. Um, and, you know, well but I, 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 I hope you're right, because if you're if this analysis is correct, then I think the the title of the first talk we ever had a year ago will stand. The title was the one that got away. Then yes, that, that would make that would that would let Georgia escape the claws of both of these these forces that are clashing at the moment in Ukraine. And these series have been sort of leading up to proving that 
hypothesis. So hopefully. <laughs> so far, so good. Um, Lasha, thank you very much for the update. This was very valuable. And I'm sure we will speak again um, in, yes. in due course. Uh, good luck with your research in Tbilisi and keep us posted. Thank you so much, Pascal. It was great. Thanks.